Welcome to Big Blend Radio with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazine.com. Lisa Perlman is a retired judge and the prize-winning author of The Sky's the Limit, People vs. Newton, The Real Trial of the 20th Century. She's also the author of American Justice on Trial, People vs. Newton, as well as the critically acclaimed third history book, with justice for some politically charged criminal trials of the early 20th century that helped shape today's America. I'm really happy to have Lisa join us on Big Blend Radio today to discuss her comprehensive biography, Call Me Phaedra, The Life and Times of Movement Lawyer Faith Stender. I'm knee deep in it, and um, I'm just going to say as a, as a woman here, I'm learning so much. I'm learning so much history. Um, I'm learning so much about women's history. Uh, civil rights history, it really is, um, you're going to learn something about American history for sure, and it's a, it's a really good read and easy to understand. So I encourage you to go to Lisa's website, it's lisaperlman.com, and that's Lisa with L-I-S-E, and of course go to Amazon and all those great stores. Welcome Lisa, how are you? I'm fine, thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for writing your book because I'm, I feel like I'm in history class, but it's a fun one, an interesting one. Um, I never realized, like, Faith Stender, man, she is a complex human being. <laughs> she really was uh, in so many Definitely. ways. Her, pers- her personality, but her drive, her persistence of, you know, going for things, um, just such a fascinating person and inspiring in a lot of ways. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting all the, it's just, I feel like I'm reading the life and times of America, <laughs> you know, I really do, uh, going through it and understanding things a little bit better, um, you know, I know my mom's told me stories, and I, you know, a lot of different women friends and men friends have told me all kinds of stories, you know, civil rights, and uh, so this is really something I think um, should appeal to even college students, wouldn't you think? Definitely, I've, I've uh, actually given a lot of talks to people of all ages, and Some of them is just an eye-opener for a generation they didn't know much about. Mm -hmm. I think it's timely for right now as well. Uh, Oh, definitely. My daughter, my oldest daughter, encouraged me to get this out because of the Me Too movement. Mm. It it really does have a lot of resonance. Well, I think think we're still, it's not just the Me Too and the sexual abuses um, and violations, but I also believe um, there's still racism, there's still um, inequality here that has to be handled. And um, I think that's the other thing too. And and prison reform, which I know Faith uh, really worked for um, towards, I think we still are battling that, don't you think? Definitely. I mean, social change is an ongoing project. Yeah. Um, So, and this isn't the only book that I've written on that subject, but yes, Definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is so. I'm really excited. And I think for women, we like to hear about women who are pioneers, and you are a pioneer as well. Uh, in, in reading about your life, and uh, you guys, I was going to say you guys, but you and Faye are similar in a lot of ways, and in, in what you've achieved in in the world of law. Well, we're different generations, but I could identify with a lot of the uh, things that she faced mm-hmm. and so, her experiences. How did you find out about Faye? I mean, is that someone you knew about, um, you know, in in your career? How did you know about her? Well, I joined the California Women Lawyers um, right after I got out of law school, and it was just a brand new organization. She was on the board at the time. I did not meet her then, but shortly after her death, they established an annual award for uh, a woman lawyer who emulated her drive, her uh, devotion to underserved populations. And I was curious about her, the, her background. Mm. And and so you started working on her and you just like, because weren't you writing your other two books at the same time or? At, no, actually things? I started with the one on face gender and then I put it aside for the other books. I was, Part of the reason I got started was because the very first a woman a chief judge of the um, Northern District here in California was a friend of Faye's, and mm-hmm. I had asked her 
uh, who she could think of as a, a woman who was an outstanding trial lawyer. And I was a trial lawyer myself mm-hmm. before I was a judge. And she immediately named Faye Stender. And because mm-hmm. of that and knowing something about her from California Women Lawyers, I was intrigued to find out more. And I met with her uh, husband who uh, gave me a, um, a box of uh, her legal files and said, it's about time. And that's how I got started. Oh, wow. What led you to become a trial lawyer and then also become a judge? Since I was young, I was fascinated by the law. I think my first hero was Abe Lincoln. And then I really enjoyed watching Perry Mason. I never wanted to go into (laughs) criminal law like Faye did. um, But I was fascinated by um, trial law and appellate law. I did both. Mm. really uh, was attracted to the field. There were a lot of people in my generation who were very interested in social justice and wanted to become lawyers. Mm. And and for women, I mean, it, when I was reading the part of when Faye, I mean, because at one point she wanted to be a, you know, a concert pianist or her mom wanted her to be a concert pianist and she was into that, but she kept, took her a little while to figure out exactly what she wanted to do. And when she started studying law in Chicago, uh, wasn't she one of the, wasn't there only like 10 women that were studying with her and half weren't even really dedicated as, as much as she was? Well, she wasn't sure she was dedicated at the time. She almost quit the first year, mm-hmm. but uh, there weren't that many women and there weren't jobs for women once you got out. So a lot of them wound up uh, getting married and then not practicing. And there weren't that many of them to begin with. And by the time I became a lawyer, which was a generation later, women were still about 3% of the legal profession. And very few of them were trial lawyers. Even when I graduated, it was extremely rare. Women went to the non-confrontational fields. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, my mom, uh, she said, you know, her first thing she wanted to do, she loves animals and she ended up being a wildlife artist and and now we're in the world of publishing here, but when, you know, she really wanted to be a veterinarian and she actually got a scholarship towards, you know, her first part of education and her dad turned it down and wouldn't let her take it. And unless she used the, used it to go and study to be a nurse because he thought of going to university or college, the only thing you should be doing as a woman is being a nurse. That's <laughs> like that. Well, he wasn't unique in that regard. Women were encouraged to be social workers, nurses, um, and teachers. And that's that. Or get in the kitchen. But and even men, very, men were doing it. <laughs> I think men were, more men were in the kitchen at that point. As chefs, um, mm-hmm. but, not, but outside the home, but not inside the home. But no, women did not have much opportunity. So even, for example, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when she graduated first in her class, couldn't get a job right away. Mm-hmm. From you know yeah. major firms, it just what they weren't offered, and and didn't Faye had to really battle with that too, you know, once she got out and um and what was you know for her to go into you know being a lawyer for the movement and then and we should even discuss that when we say the movement um because I think sometimes also even in today's society if you say Black Panther I'm not talking about the movie uh, you say the Black Panthers. Right. There's people who just have this fear and have like a very one tunneled perception of who the Black Panthers were. And um, I feel like, you know, for a woman to get into the arena that she did, that wasn't exactly an easy thing to do. And I don't think it would even be easy today. No, it wasn't easy, but she was in a circle um, of progressives in the Bay Area that reinforced each other. She went to work for one of two um Firms. One there was one in San Francisco and one in the uh, East Bay in Oakland mm-hmm. um, that specialized in taking cases for um, minorities, uh, mm-hmm. which was very rare, and pursuing their claims either in, for um, in civil claims or in representing them in the criminal courts. So that's where the case came. The the um, Panther case came to Charles Gary, who was her partner. Uh, mm-hmm. and when she was an associate, and he needed her help uh, on the case because he was more, he was known as a street fighter in the courtroom. He was really good on his feet, but he did not like 
to do motion work and Faye was really good at marshalling all the law and the changes in the law during the Warren court years um, that helped uh, criminal defendants uh, make motions to suppress potential evidence or other things that hadn't traditionally been available. Mm. And she learned that being a clerk at the California Supreme Court. Mm. And in regards to the Black Panther side, do you think that people understand them today? That there, there's no. I think uh, they don't. They they have um, the Panthers w had a, a reputation, obviously, for violence in the out to the outside world. But they also uh, were spokespeople for their communities on. Uh, a number of fronts that were really important. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them was ethnic studies. Uh, they were among the uh, leaders in getting colleges to have ethnic study departments and to hire uh, minority teachers, which they hadn't been doing before. And from that came the women's movement, where they where women got women's studies and gay studies. All of that came out of the late '60s with uh, the Panthers and others pushing for a non-Eurocentric white male approach to history. And, and still literature. there. <laughs> Sorry, I just, I well, there, there are so... some changes. There yeah. are changes, but it's much broader. You have many more mm -hmm. options of what you study. Absolutely. And that wasn't true before then. Mm -hmm. So that was that's a huge impact that they had. The other thing the Panthers did to build community support mm -hmm. was that they were uh, providing free breakfast for uh, kids in um, poor communities. Uh, they were also um, doing sickle cell anemia testing. A lot of things the government just wasn't doing back then. You know, it's 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 interesting. I mean, that that's why I wanted to ask you on that because I think that, like I was saying, people have this one tunnel perception at times and not looking at the whole thing. I don't know if it's just a convenience thing or how that happens, but the what I find very interesting about your, your book, and when we say comprehensive, it is, but it is um, for someone who's not a lawyer, it's easy to read, and I can grasp what you're, what you're you know, sharing with us. Just like we were talking about, okay, how things have changed uh, or not changed, they are, but because there's so many things that go into making a change. It doesn't happen overnight. You can't just say prison reform and then boom, it's done. No, it, it happens slowly, but I'll give you the biggest example, which is why I wrote my two books on the um, Huey Newton trial. The case uh, against Huey Newton, which was a death penalty murder trial, normally up until that time, the jury would have been 12 white men most of the time. Mm -hmm. And that was supposed to be a, what, you, what the Constitution guaranteed as a jury of one's peers. Well, they weren't their, the peers of the defendants when a lot of defendants were minority defendants. And it, the team that Faye was on worked really hard to seat a different jury. And what they got were seven women, uh, four minorities. And the jury chose as their foreman the only black among them who became the first black foreman of a major murder trial wow. in America. And that perspective was very different from the traditional white male and usually authoritarian white male jury that was seated up until June of 1968 in most places in America. So what happened was a book was written about that the following year called Minimizing Racism in Jury Trials that became the Bible for criminal defense lawyers nationwide. And that was a huge impact that we feel today. We, we look at a criminal trial now and we say, oh, we expect to see women and minorities on the jury, mm, right? And that's what you—that's what you see in in most places. That was not true then, and that it was makes, a major change that happened as a result of this trial. And it makes you think differently about jury duty and your duty to that. You know, you, when you get the jury right. duty calling, everybody's like, "Oh no!" But then to me, it's like, "Oh, cool. What, what are you going to see?" Well, you that, never know. It's it's very important. That's why we're doing the documentary. Because the oh, documentary wow. focuses on the unsung hero, uh, the uh, foreman of that jury who risked his life and his career to be in that position because he feared race war would occur otherwise if there wasn't community uh, belief that this was going to be a fair trial. 
Wow. It was right after Martin Luther King's assassination and Bobby Kennedy's assassination. It was a very tumultuous year. Mm. And, and people accepted yeah. the verdict. And it was, a, yeah, here comes a, a, you know, a changed jury. And, you know, also with her, um, she, I mean, she was, she was murdered. And yes you know, and no. The, let, okay. me, let me just address yeah, that briefly. Ahead. Many of her friends describe what happened to her as murder. Uh, what happened was that she was shot in her home and yeah. left for dead, but she survived. She became the star witness for the prosecution, which was not the side of case, the criminal cases she'd ever associated with, and the fellow was convicted. Shortly after his conviction, she committed suicide, and her friends treat that as all one of yeah. prolonged event for good reason, but that was how it occurred. See, I can tell you're a judge, <laughs> you know, because you've got to be 100%. Like, you can't just lump it all in there because emotionally, you know, and how that happened, I mean, it's just like, wow. And and how she had to now be in hiding almost. I mean, that must have been really rough on her to it suddenly. Was, the whole thing was rough to be isolated. She fled to Hong Kong after the trial. Uh, she was under, uh, she was basically um, protected 24 hours a day uh, up until the trial because there was fear, legitimate fear of uh, retaliation by the Black Marilla family, mm. which was a prison gang that uh, the fellow who shot her was affiliated with. Mm. So, but when the trial ended, she no longer had police protection. And mm. so she fled the country. And she didn't know how she could get back without uh, endangering herself and her family. Yeah, and she true. was also emotionally distraught. And, and physically, she was paraplegic. She was confined to a wheelchair. So it really all came from that shooting in her home. And, and at the time, she had a girlfriend as well. So partway through her life, she you know, discovered that she was bisexual. But she seemed to have... I know and she married, she was happy, um, but she seemed to have a few, you know, love affairs through her time. And, you know, then, yes. you know, taking taking her awareness, you know, and uh, understanding that she's now, okay, I'm bisexual, I've, you know, had, you know, uh, you know, lovers, but she understood also, and this is so, I think this is crucial, when she stood up for equality and for, you know, unmarried life partners, because I think that's really, I mean, that's, only, we're still fighting that. I have a friend, a uh, very, very dear friend. Um, they were together, uh, Michael and Spider, for 30 plus, 35 plus years as partners. And um, Spider ended up with uh, liver cancer and they got married and Spider passed away. And and he didn't, unfortunately, this sounds terrible, but, you know, now he, Michael was basically, you know, at home uh, for a lot of different reasons. And so he, you know, most people would be able to draw the social security of a past, you know, um, you know, partner uh, if, if you were married. But because of the timing of his death, and we're all happy here in Arizona that, yes, now, you know, gay marriage is allowed he's not allowed to draw that social security, which is insane. You know, it's like they were together for years and Michael supported Spider in so many ways. It's like, and that's that. <laughs> it's like, boom, right. Well, out. you'll read the chapter that I wrote about that, but she did the, the Palmoni case when it was a pioneering thing to do. And neither the main case, which is uh, involved with actor Lee Marvin, nor the case that she had, uh, which also got national attention, uh, wound up uh, winning for their clients because it turned out that Lee Marvin uh, already had a wife um, that when he moved in uh, with Michelle and spent years with her. The same thing was true with the publisher of the Berkeley Barb that Faye was, whom Faye was suing. So, you know, the circumstances can be such that you might not recover, and, and they actually um, didn't win their cases. Yeah. But, but they just, set a precedent for being able to pursue those claims. And that's it. That's exactly the part is like, hello, these are all these issues we're going through in, in our country. 
And, uh, and you know, and, and that's the thing is if someone doesn't take the first step, it, it's not always the, a matter of winning. It's about getting the movement started in in some way, whichever movement it is, you know, is taking those steps. It's, you know, over our, over the years on our show, we've done so many different issues where, uh, you know, people are standing up for, um, you know, whether it's, you know, something climate change or, uh, you know, something with our national parks or, you know, these different issues, we've covered them on shows and then everything wins. And then a new government comes in and it's like, we have to start all over again. And then you have to rally everybody up. And it seems like things go in these cycles, but if you don't take that first step, it's never going to get on that path to winning. Absolutely. Actually, my other book with justice for some, which I uh, published last year, talks about that because there were a, a number of very famous trials in the early part of the 20th century that uh, are we have echoes of today because things don't always progress forward. Sometimes they go in cycles uh, and there's a backlash. And mm -hmm. so you can see how things were and what the tendencies are now to go back to, to some extent. Like, for example, the Ku Klux Klan coming into uh, existence again in the 20th century and then fading oh out God. and now growing again. And yeah. so there's a lot to learn from looking back at what happened and how much progress has been made. There has been significant progress. And we forget about that. Women and minorities definitely have more rights than they did 100 years ago. Do you, do you think also of her Jewish faith and heritage that um, did she feel, obviously as women throughout the years we felt of being the, the minority side, but did she ever feel that way of her faith in, in Absolutely. society? Absolutely. And I cover that specifically. She takes a long trip to Europe um, the year before she was shot. And she reflects at length on her Jewish heritage and what it means to be a Jew, especially in Europe, where she felt that there was still discrimination. Um, so, and, yes. And even in, in, in one of the colleges that she went to, they didn't have, you know, I think there was there was um, one of the churches. Or so, there wasn't a place as much for her uh, to practice her faith. I don't think in some of the schools and colleges in the country we didn't have that everywhere. So there's it's, we didn't, but I don't recall her focusing on that in college. Yeah, yeah. Um, she was actually well. She had a friend in, in college uh, at Cal when she transferred back from Reed to Cal, who. Um, noticed that um, her friend was Chinese, had moved to America uh, when she was 15. And she had trouble telling her Jewish friends from her non-Jewish friends because the Jewish friends weren't practicing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so she yeah, didn't know what distinguished them. And she was surprised when Faye started raising her children with, with some um, reinforcement of their Jewish heritage. And one part, you know, the beginning of the book, you talk about, um, this is when she was up in Portland, when she had, you know, she she was engaged to be married to Robert Richter, right, the documentarian, uh -huh. and and his his story is like crazy what happened with him, and ending up in, like, a jail here, but it's like one of those crazy desert jails, you know, they, what's his name, did that in Phoenix, what, Arpeo did that, those kind of right. really bad jail well just <laughs> not cool right well richter actually eventually got that expunged oh wow that sentence uh but uh it was quite an experience and he's okay. still around he lives in new york and he's working uh with me on the film project the documentary oh how wonderful that's awesome and you know it's the story of what they were going through here but also understanding and going over the border i thought was very interesting because again I felt like I was reading something from what's going on today, you know, what she was in going over the border into Mexico and understanding um, what, the, how people needed help and those who were crossing over into here, too. I, I thought that was really interesting. It felt like, again, like now, <laughs> what we're reading now. There, there are a lot of parallels. She noticed that when she went to law school, because there were deportations of Mexicans or Mexican workers, um, and it, that concerned her greatly. It's one of the things that drew her to the um, Lawyers Guild um, uh, student um, group that was at the University of Chicago um, Law School. And that's where she met her husband, Marvin Stender. He was the president. Hmm. What do you think she would, if she was here now, 
What do you think? Do you think should still be, you know, fighting in some way or teaching or something? Well, she was, I, she was headed toward teaching. Um, mm -hmm. and that was, uh, uh, she had an idea for a book, but it was actually not very different from the book that I wrote about using famous trials, um, as to uh, teach a course, um, to law students and college students, um, that were trials about social change or that involved, um, major issues that ought to be addressed. So she might well have done that. I think she would be very concerned today. But you have to look at it from a question of when in her life you're talking about. I mean, she became extremely disillusioned after she was shot. But if you're looking at her before then, she had all these ideas. She always had new ideas for new projects because there's so much to work on. She, since she was in college, she wanted to change things. And there was plenty to change. Yeah, she really did have that. Um, that's what it, she's pretty radical. I mean, she just kind of like, okay, I'm going to do this. And she wasn't really fearful of change. It didn't seem like she just kind sometimes of, she was and sometimes she was and she could she could vacillate on that um mm -hmm. it didn't stop her from taking action but she would worry over it i think that this your book should be like in every young woman's hands you know in regards to thank you i really do because you know i'm reading it and i'm reading it carefully and it's taking me time which is fine. It's, 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 it's to me because I'm learning stuff. I'm like, oh man, I didn't even know this was going on at this time. Like, really? You know, <laughs> so to me, it's like one of these books that it's, I'm going to be reading and rereading because I'm learning. And, and I think that's what's so exciting about it is just to kind of, it puts, you paint a picture of, of what's happening and what has happened. And then to be able to have those parallel lines, I think is really crucial for now. Um, do you ever see this becoming a documentary? Because I think she would just, that would be amazing to see. Well, I, I'm not sure how you can make it a documentary. I mean, it's possible, I suppose. We're working on one now about the Newton trial itself, and we have some survivors and several people who who are key who, who, who died years ago. And it's probably more of a... It, more likely that you can make it into a narrative film yeah. um, that with actors. Um, mm -hmm. rather than a documentary. Um, but I could see that because she was so dramatic. I mean, there's some, I interviewed dozens of her friends and opposing counsel and uh, her sister and her husband and people from different perspectives. So I really got a, a com fairly complete picture um, of her. She wrote, I mean, nowadays we don't write so much. She wrote a lot of letters to people. Um, and so there's a lot to work with so i feel mm. like i know her yeah um, well this was a, she was this an amazing is, woman i do have a, i've been hearing from people who wanted to uh, study this in their book club so i think that's that's a good thing i, um, I believe you know she made be. some yeah go ahead i'm sorry no, go ahead we just had a delay there. i was just gonna say she made she made uh some mistakes too and so there's some mm -hmm. cautionary tales in there uh, yeah. But she was a fascinating person who never gave up, and I dedicated the book um, to all women throughout history who were um, working towards social change, and their response to anyone who was trying to keep them from doing it is nevertheless she persisted, or they yeah. persisted. Um, now, when, it, when does your documentary come out, do you think? Well, that's a good question. We're working on finishing the funding. We uh, have a 13-minute uh, trailer work sample that we submitted last year to the Berkeley Film Foundation, and it won Best Civil Rights Project. We need to raise the rest of the money to finish editing it. So okay. um, that's where we are right now. The sooner we raise the money, the sooner it comes out. We've interviewed almost everyone we um, needed to interview for the film. It's a lot of work. It really is. Any kind of, it, that's what I'm saying. Even, you know, uh, call me uh, Phaedra. It is, this is just so much work that has gone into it, you know. I, I do want to touch on this too. Uh, one of the topics is free speech. Do you feel we're going backwards now in the free speech or are we getting better? How do you feel about now? Uh, well, I, compared to them, 
Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I think we're probably better than then in some ways because um, one of the issues, the free speech movement came about on the Berkeley campus because the university said we're not going to let any outside groups on the campus to um, push their ideas at all. Conservative, liberal, you name it. And that was what they rebelled against. And they actually, the university changed its policy. So mm -hmm. it's a question of when you're talking about, because that push happened at that time. The McCarthy era was very um, uh, much uh, in an era when people were afraid to speak out. Mm. I, because I, of I've, the consequences, people lost their jobs, people committed suicide. So it, it depends on which part of which, you know, when you're talking about the 50s, the 60s, or the 70s. Yeah, it, there well, were, it keeps changing. It, yeah, because I feel now, like when you think about trying to get free speech out there, the fear factor, I feel like we're in that, we're in a mixed bag of it now. I feel like our, our press is being challenged. Um, I'm worried about that, you know. Well, there's things. plenty of criticism being uh, lobbed, but on the other hand, you have an awful lot of people who are feeling free to say what they believe. The, the, um, the real question is how it all turns out. How much mm -hmm. do people fight for the continuing rights that they had exercised that they feel are being eroded? Hmm. because you have to keep doing that it's not something that automatically stays the same I think that one of the things younger women are realizing now is that the battle that was fought when I was young for Roe versus Wade is not something that was a given that would stay mm -hmm. it's something that has to be uh, refought mm -hmm. I, I think that's part so, of the importance of books like yours that it reminds us of all these battles and and each one may seem oh it's all these little little things add up to the big thing right we were just saying talking about that but i think it's so important that we understand how much work goes into making one thing happen which is all for a bigger you know movement or bigger result uh, you know bigger better and it and nothing ever stays the same. You're right. You you could win something and you think, okay, now we're all going to be safe and free and we can do this. And then it'll change within a second. So you can never take those um, steps for granted. And I think that's what your book really reminds us of is to have that awareness, uh, uh, respect for it as well, and to not lose the fights that other people have done in the past. You know, so I think it's absolutely there. There, there has been a lot of progress and that's that's a good thing but you mm -hmm. don't want it slipping away mm -mm. no I mean because women are we have women senators we have women we have a woman running for president we, I mean there are a lot of things that would not have occurred back then mm -hmm. um, and they operated in a world that was almost exclusively a white male monopoly mm -hmm. and that was also on the news so that if you watch the news it was either Walter Cronkite or Huntley Brinkley um, it was that people like Belva Davis, who I uh, mentioned in the book, was um, she was the pioneering African American newswoman on uh, on the West Coast in 1960s, um, and she was very aware that it was basically a white male world, and so that was the way news was interpreted. That's how the newspaper publishers, um, you know, told everyone the news. So it was very. Mm -hmm. If you had to be having like an underground newspaper or whatever to have a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and here's the other part is the importance, going back to your book and understanding all these steps, is understanding the judicial system and the importance of even in voting. It's always like, oh, the president's most important or our senators or governors. But I think in the last, you know, 20 years maybe, especially now, we're realizing the importance of who we vote for our judges and things like that, right? And, and don't we need to Absolutely. understand? And I think we're I learning that. You, Go ahead. You know, I was just going to tell you that I was extremely disappointed in my own county, which is a very progressive county in California. We just had an election in June and only 20% of registered voters turned out. That's not good. 
No, that's, it's not good. And and one of the things on the ballot, I'll give you just an example. One of the things on the ballot was a, a local sales tax that would have expanded preschools for um, children throughout the county. And I'm oh. not sure. I don't have the results yet, but it was very close as to whether it passed or not because you needed to have two thirds um, mm. with our restrictive, um, you know, that mm-hmm. was put in uh, about 30 years ago or more that you have to have two thirds vote for that kind of a tax. And they almost made it, but I'm not sure they did make it. I have to double check. And I'm thinking, what about all the people who didn't vote who would have benefited? You could have been that one people need to know. made the change. You know what I mean? It's all right. that, you know, it's like every vote counts. And that's the thing. And I feel like we have to understand our, our American system, our, our American judicial system, our government systems. I feel like we're learning now that, oh, we all thought this could happen or wouldn't happen. That's not possible. Then we're finding out, oh, yes, it is. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think we're going well, through that's a very why, yeah. That's why I'm cheered by what happened with all the women who decided to run mm-hmm. for office this last I know. year. They yeah. woke up to realize that it could be them in office and that could make a difference. Mm-hmm. I'm seeing more and more women in uh, municipal roles, uh, municipalities, mayor, uh, that kind of thing too, which I think is also really good because I think, you know, everything is important in regards to leadership and um, communities, cities, that's just as important. And I'm seeing more and more women um, take those positions, which is great to see that they're there. absolutely. It, it it's about time. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, you know, it has been such a pleasure, Lisa. Thank you so much for joining us, and and really thank you for writing this because, as I said, I'm not done, um, but I am really getting a good education, and, and I, I really appreciate it. My the favorite thing I'm, in my career is that I feel like I'm in college every day, interviewing people and reading books oh, like yours. So it's really cool. So um, everybody, Wonderful. again, the book is Call Me Phaedra, The Life and Times of Movement Lawyer Faye Stender. Uh, and go to lisaperlman.com. It's L-I-S-E. That way you can keep up with the documentary and her all her books. Uh, but before you go, Lisa, tell everybody, Call Me Phaedra, uh, why you decided to name the book that. Faye Stender told her best friends that after she was shot because there was a Greek uh, a queen in ancient times called Phaedra who fell in love with her biracial stepson and tried to elevate him to the throne. That did not work. He was killed by her husband, King Theseus, and she committed suicide. And Faye said, call me Phaedra. Yeah. Wow. So there you go. That's that's the beginning of the book right there. <laughs> you know, when you read this, it's it just you're you just you know, I mean you start right there, it starts like, Wow, okay, <laughs> what am I getting myself into? And then you're like, Wow, this is really cool because I'm going, Okay, so how do you introduce uh you know, face Stender on you know, who is face Stender? And I'm like, Well, we could be here for for days explaining all the things she did. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because she's done right. so much. Wow. And one wow. of the things she did is she studied literature, and so she was she loved the play um, uh, Phaedra by Racine. Mm-hmm. So she was very much aware of that as a college student, and she goes back to visit Greece right before she was shot, just coincidentally. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's pretty amazing connection into her life. Absolutely. Again, everyone, go to lisaperlman.com. The book is Call Me Phaedra, The Life and Times of Movement Lawyer Faye Stender. And uh, we want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, Big Blend Radio airs Monday through Thursdays, 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Times, and Fridays and Sundays at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Just go to bigblendradio.com. The schedule's there. And also, uh, we've got more author interviews if you just go to blendradioandtv.com. But we have a special song. We always like to play music for our guests. Uh, This song is called Freedom Has a Way, which I thought kind of goes with this, uh, especially when we talk about law. It is uh, from a musician, James Saunders, out in South Africa. Uh, He's he lives down the road from where we used to live in, in uh, near Cape Town, and Hermanus is the town, and uh, you can go to jamessaundersmusician.com, but here it is. Freedom has a way. Thanks so much, Lisa. Thank you.
before me, stretching out below. It'll take forever if only I go real slow. So take me by the hand, lead me through the door. There's a light in the sky that beckons in the night, leading to a distant shore. Leading to a distant shore. Away, like the perfect stranger that came in your world to stay. I walked across these mountains, sailed across the sea, looked down into those deep blue waters a thousand miles away. I could never follow your religion all the way. Fear is her companion, the master and his slave. The master and his slave. Freedom has a way. Like the perfect stranger that came in your world to stay. Where does it end? What will you say? Your story will never be in black and white. It's always written in grey. Just a handful of memories. To write down in the sand, but these things that are forged so deep inside are never easy to understand. Never easy to understand. Ooh, freedom has a way, like the perfect stranger that. Like the perfect strain.